Lee said to me, why don't we put them together instead of you running two? And it was like, well, I hadn't thought of that. 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, it was a done deal. So we actually brought three companies. That was in May 2005 up until 2018. We did 10 for ourselves, and when I exited, I'd actually helped 31 other companies do some sort of M&A activity. Welcome to Now That's It, Stories of MSP Success, where we dive into the journeys of some of the trailblazers in our industry to find out how they used their passion for technology to help turn managed services into the thriving sector it is today. I'm Chris Massey. This week on Now That's It, Australia's Ryan Fuzzy Spillane has made a name for himself around the world as the M&A guy, and rightfully so. Taking part in 10 himself while running an MSP and helping more than 30 companies through their mergers and acquisitions. But he wasn't always the M&A guy, and he wasn't always in IT. So the first business I started uh, importing paraffin wax candles from Hong Kong to Australia when I was 12. So yeah, not your, not your little lemonade stand uh, down on the corner or something like that. So that was the first one. I then had that for a little bit. I then had a, a yeah, another business when I was 16 during high school, uh, when actually did some uh, accounting certificates uh, while I was actually through my high, high school uh, university, not even university, but high school days. Um, and then started uh, pulling apart computers, doing an upgrade of uh, an old, uh, sort of, well, holy crap, I actually started with a 286, but we'll ignore that. But then, yeah, Pentium 75 was the first real computer. Uh, overclocked it to a Pentium 90, added memory to it, and a bunch of other things. Found it was actually quite a fun and interesting. And then uh, did something you probably shouldn't do sometimes, and that's turned a hobby into a work. Started the first IT company in 19, at the end of 1997. So... I wasn't even legally old enough to have a business again. Um, so as soon as I hit, hit 18, then I had a, a company set up and I started officially uh, running an IT business. Now, back in 97 or those those late 90s days, uh, managed services wasn't really a thing, right? I mean, you were doing more break fix. Uh, how, tell me a little bit about that. Pretty much all of it was break fix back in those days. Um, I, however, there was a, an interesting one. Because in 1999, one of my first clients, we actually agreed to put in what would be called managed services. So in 1999, we had an insurance brokerage. It was about 35, 40 staff, had three offices. And we, we actually put together a, uh, a managed services offering that was about 3300 3000 3300 a month. So not far off about $90, $95 a user a month. Um, and yeah, put that in place in 1999. So... We joked about it at the time that the first agreement was you break it, we fix it, you pay for it. It was just that simple. Um, but no, we uh, so, so the, 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 the the owners and the, the the oversight of that particular customer couldn't handle that. So we needed something real. Uh, so anyway, we put a very basic one page back together. But uh, but yeah, the first ever managed services for us was in '99. So it was we only ever had two clients on it at that time. Uh, the first one being insurance brokerage, then another one. Everyone else was break fix. Uh, which definitely was what it was back then. And uh, if you made profit and made a bit of profit, it was good. Um, then over over the last 25 years, and, uh, things have changed a little bit, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. Yeah. How'd you come up with that idea for, for that fixed price contract? I mean, obviously there weren't many other people doing it at the time. So what where'd you get that idea? Uh, look, let's uh, look at this. I haven't been asked that question a bloody long time. Let's <laughs> give it. Um, to be honest, I actually think part of it's laziness. Um, let's be honest about it. Is I couldn't have bothered doing uh, tracking or like we did track the time. We used uh, some some ticket management software uh, in early years. We were using ticket ma- uh, ticket management, uh, but in the old the late nineties, it was like emails and tasks and th- just random things. It was uh, I had a one day one page day planner and I knew where I was and knew where the first tech was and things like that. So. Um, and just basically counted the time. And then every month or every week, you had to do a bunch of invoicing. So I think a lot of it, to be honest, was probably from laziness. I didn't want to have to do a bunch of uh, a bunch of billing where one one bill each month made life a lot easier. Yeah, we like to call that if efficiency, not laziness. <laughs> you were super efficient. That's yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> which, I, which I would now slap myself hard for doing something like that. But we won't talk, won't talk about that one. But yes, no. It's, uh, it was, it would look, it was efficient. It was about, uh, just being able to have more clients, more, ultimately more billable time at the time. So, and that kind of worked pretty well. And then put in the first ticketing system, which was a, a very simple ticketing system called footprints many years ago, and used to run a report out of that at the end of each month. It would tell me how much time we spent for, for each ticket at each client. And that just, uh, 
used to copy and paste that into into a, a uh, MYOB or an accounting package that's uh, prevalent down here, um, and that was that we used to send out the invoices. It's scary, and and um, I didn't start my IT career very much um, later than you. It was about the same time, but I remember the first our first managed services as well. And uh, the PSA was something we built, right? And that just sounds like just like what you were doing. I mean, there wasn't a great ticket tracking system. And so you were doing a combination of the spreadsheet, database, whatever, to be able to keep keep track of your time and what you were actually doing. So that's great. That, that, that does bring back memories for sure. When we actually did the first merge together, um, which we'll talk about later, uh, they'd actually built a ticketing engine built on Microsoft uh, Exchange public folders. Wow, um, that's, that's it, going it, way back. Yep, that's right. So it's amazing what what could be done back then. Yeah. So you were actually running. You were in two MSPs at the same time, right? You had two of them. How did that work? What was that story all about? <laughs> um, well, I was only probably in two of them for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. But yes, um, a friend contacted me from the industry. We knew each other through the small business server user groups back then, or the good old SBS products. Um, and yeah, he, uh, he was having some troubles in, in his business and, and wanted to catch up and have a, have a meeting. So we, we caught up and, uh, then, uh, we talked through a few options. And one of those options is I'd come in, um, take 30% of the business, work two days a week, uh, in his business, uh, because I was good at the admin. I was, look, I was quite technical, but I was, I was good at admin and finance as well. Um, and then I, at that point in time, my old IT company, I was working a nine day fortnight. So I was actually having a, a day off every fortnight. I, had a bit of life, work-life balance back then. Um, for a go, I basically slept for an extra day. Um, <laughs> caught odd things. Uh, but yes, decided that no, uh, was going to run two IT businesses at the time. And then uh, we actually went, hilariously, we went and grabbed Subway for lunch. And uh, I still remember it. And dropped the mail off. And he said to me, why, why don't we put them together? And why does, uh, instead of you running two, and it was like, well, I hadn't thought of that. And it's like, uh, yeah, a couple of, 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, it was pretty much a, yeah, we saw, saw through the ideas. We had to finalize some stuff a bit legally, but yeah, it was, it was a done deal. So we actually brought three companies. That was in May, 2005. We had that first conversation in, uh, in uh, March, 2005. Um, but by May, we were basically all trading together under, under one, one company. And we brought a third company in at the time. So we brought three companies in at the one time. Yeah. 2005 is, um, the first M and A that you were sort of part of and obviously that the two were you were working for both of them or at least helping somebody out <laughs> how did the, how did you get introduced to the third one how what was that all about so wayne was the founder of correct solutions and he actually knew uh, a lady named marianne who did um from Stayhead business systems or nickname stabs um but yes it's uh what's his name uh, she was doing uh, accounting systems which correct had done in the past and crm systems so it was logical to kind of bring to bring the three together and and start seeing that they're again selling CRM and uh, we were doing we we're supporting a number of accounting systems for clients anyway, as in the underlying infrastructure. And a lot of times they'd ask, "Oh, can you help fix the problem with the with the app?" So it wasn't that much of a, a reach compared to what what you do nowadays. That's great. So 2005, you you're merging these companies, you're creating this 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 brand new MSP, if you will, or service provider. Did you have a pretty good pulse on the rest of the market? Fuzzy was, how did you how did you feel that the Australian New Zealand IT service market really compared to to the rest of the world? It was interesting because we started coming up um, from September, I think that year, uh, we started coming up to the old um, a couple of conferences each set like a September conference every year up in the US, and it was good coming up and and being around other other IT companies and where it was on the Microsoft campus, it was a bit of fun. But it was also, we learnt a lot from it because at the point in time, I would have said that we would have been about two years behind the North American market. So we could come up there for a year or two, get an idea, understand the product, understand what's happening up there as such, and be able to get some of those products and some of those solutions and bring them back into country and be ready before before anyone else was or before, like, yes, other people would be as well, but before the market was really ready for it. So we did that for, for a number of years, came up every every year around September, um, spent about uh, seven or eight days there, uh, even 10 days. And then as later, when time went on, it became twice a year and whatnot. But 
and during those years, uh, it ended up being where we'd, we'd be then one year behind you. Then it was six months behind North America. And in certain aspects now, it's actually quite the opposite. We will actually get access to product from vendors uh, in the Australian and New Zealand market space long before other parts of the world. Because we're big enough to, as a sample size, and we're noisy enough if something doesn't work. But let's be honest about it, if they screw it up, we're still only a small part of the global IT economy. So that's why vendors, and I'm seeing a lot of smirks and, and laughs just for context of those that don't see the other people, other people's faces. But that's pretty much what it is. The Australian market is, yeah, we're, we're noisy. We tell you what we like and what we don't like and what we want fixed. So you definitely get lots of feedback on your product. And, uh, and yeah, uh, but as I said, if you, if you stuff it up, then yeah, it's, it's just still a small enough market that you can still go after Asia, Europe, and the US without a problem. That's great. That's why we love you Aussies. You know, you're just, you have no filter. You just tell us like it is, right? <laughs> oh, so think, great. I think, I think we are filtered. I think we're, we're direct. I think yeah. we're still professionally respectful, but, of we will course. You, we will, but we will happily tell you what we think too. That's right. That's great. Awesome. Yeah. So, all right. So you got to tell us, or at least tell me why you won't tell us, where did the nickname Fuzzy come from? There's probably only, I'd say 20 people in the world that actually really know where the nickname came from. And it was actually for one of those visits. Um, uh -huh. I'm not going to tell you where it came from. Uh, okay. I would normally tell you, uh, I, uh, there's a couple of people that are still sworn to secrecy that know and know that if they uh, if they did tell anyone, they might end up with uh, uh, concrete shoes at the bottom of the, the bottom of the ocean somewhere. Um, but yes, it's just it's it's hilarious. It's this really small piece that's now over years has grown out of mass proportion, and it's just it's just let it keep going. Yeah. I was just going to say every publication, every podcast, every story you're in fuzzy is the, is how you're referred to. So, you know, if someone asked me if Ryan, I, I wouldn't know, but yeah. Uh, the amount of people I've heard over the years, and it's, it's less common nowadays, but go back probably five or eight years that would go up to the U S for a conference. And one person would be talking about this Aussie name, Ryan, or one be talking about this Aussie name fuzzy. And then it would take him 20 or 30 minutes to realize the same person. Because half the people, at least I'd say two thirds of the people in North America didn't know me as Ryan. They just knew me as Fuzzy. And everyone down here knew me mostly as Ryan rather than Fuzzy. And then, as again, as global happens and as uh, everything starts happening, everyone knows everything. Um, so, yeah, everyone kind of knows me as both nowadays. So, yeah, it's quite funny. Sounds good. All right, all you listeners, next time you see Fuzzy at one of these conference events, make sure you uh, buy him a cocktail and then um, ask him what, where he got his name. And he'll you'll you'll be sworn to secrecy, but he may or may not tell you. So we'll see. <laughs> if you buy enough cocktails that uh, that, that means you won't remember, it means you won't remember them. Remember it, then I might tell you. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. Awesome. All right. So you so you're becoming the M and A guy. So between sort of the years of 2005, 2000, you know, 2022, so the last you know 15, 18 years, lots of M and A happening in the MSP space. What do you think the reason was? What's, what's fueling that, that sort of um, transaction? Look, it depends. Uh, look, there's a, there's a number of answers of that, uh, to that, Chris, to be honest. It comes down to why you were doing it or why you are doing it. And that can be a little bit different. It's a, an easy form of, not necessarily easy, it's another form of growth. Um, if businesses are, are struggling or aren't, aren't growing at a stretcher they want, uh, through natural and organic growth, then it's uh, acquisition can definitely help with that. So uh, we did it for, so between 2005 and 2018, uh, we did 10 uh, M&As into Correct Solutions. Um, eight of them, I would say, are successful. Two of them were not, and we actually demerged them back out, uh, which I openly talk about. I don't talk about who they are, uh, because one of them is still actually a, a name in the industry. But yes, we, we actually did, um, we did 10 M&As. Um, and then, yeah, so through that period, it was a case for us. Of, it was a form of growth. It was We were still growing naturally. Um, and then it was along the way through some of the HGP groups, some of the um, visits to the US, it was talking to people that they were acquiring as a as a form of growth and heard, heard something interesting uh, a, long, a long time back saying that uh, almost an acquisition every 18 months or two years is a kind of helps bolster your growth as in, you start with organic growth and you still do this and you keep growing. And it was like, okay, well, this could kind of work. And 
uh, it was funny because for years everyone used to ask, where do I find these M&As? Because we were doing quite a few. And it was, it was, I didn't find them. Like, it was funny. I was just having conversations with people. Wasn't doing anything different, doing anything special. I was just talking about it. And most people were too scared or too worried about talking about it. I was like, well, no, it's, we're humans. We don't set out to make mistakes deliberately. Yes, the odd one stuffs up and we, we can talk about those. But uh, likewise, if you do it well and do enough of them, you get pretty good at it. So over that, uh, up until 2018, we uh, we did ten for ourselves. I actually did three outside of the IT industry, and and had other and still have other companies in other industries as well. But yes, uh, bought a couple of other companies in other industries, um, and then helped a number of other people along that way. So up until uh, when I exited, we I'd actually helped thirty one other companies do some sort of M and A activity from doing a valuation or looking over someone's books or. Uh, they've already done uh, an acquisition and now don't know how to integrate it well or stuffed it all up and it's like, oh, can you just give us a hand or come and help? So, yeah, it kind of became a bit of, bit known for M&A and, uh, and that's kind of when I knew that we were going to exit our MSP, which we'll talk a lot more about later in the, in the podcast. Um, I felt that, okay, I, I love this. It's uh, something I'm passionate about. So why not? I didn't really want to leave, leave the industry. I was under a no-compete. And it's like, well, hey, I can do the best of both. I can still be around the industry, helping people in the industry, doing almost what I love without having to deal with the end users. So, yeah, what was, c- couldn't get a lot better than that. That's a beautiful thing. So you, uh, obviously, the growth side makes a lot of sense. I know, I, you know, I would say that it's probably not as uncommon when we talk to our partners that they are, they've either been approached or they've considered some M&A themselves. Um, have you ever... For for the those ten M uh, M and A um, deals that you did over that you know decade, you know fifteen years or so, were any of them ever to get into a different market or a different city, a geography, or was it just purely growth back in those days? It was growth. We did look at another another state. Um, we ended up. It's funny because at one point we actually had three offices in Sydney, like in the one city we were in. But again, it can be quite busy with traffic depending on the time of the day. We actually had three offices in in the same city, um, and that's that's interesting. Trying to manage the the culture because every office does have a slight variation to to your core culture, um, and it's quite interesting because it's no different than when you go into state. So we did look at going into state. We did a, a bunch of due diligence on a on, on a partner in another state and didn't end up executing. I'm still friends with them today. Still get on really well with them and see them quite a bit, but it just it wasn't going to suit the the target demographic and the target size customer we had started moving to in Sydney, uh, that state uh, had slightly smaller clients and we didn't want to, at that point in time, we were mature enough to realize we didn't want to have to have split marketing, split focus, split everything. So we, we decided against doing that. So um, that was actually, in my mind, probably a smart decision. I do know a lot of people that use it for uh, growth into, into new geography, like geographies or new skill set. Um, if you think about it, even back in 2005, we moved into CRM and accounting systems, um, which we didn't end up keeping long term, to, uh, to be honest, but we did actually move into another area through an acquisition. And that's where I see people nowadays moving into Power Apps or the Power Platforms from Microsoft, or uh, they get involved to an ERP or a, an SAP or something like that, a system. And that's how they, they grow as well by moving into another area. I also, the counter to that, and I also, I like playing devil's advocate. I like playing both sides of a coin. I do it really well, I think. Um, there's also an interesting thing that someone said many years ago that I heard and has resonated with me for a long time. Why go into state unless you have really topped out or have achieved everything you can in your current location? It's, it's interesting because I see a lot in the US companies and it's a little bit in Australia where they keep growing and grow everywhere and go into another location. And it can work and it does work. And it is very successful for some people. Um, and I'm not saying anything against that to be clear. But on the other hand, um, unless you've really hit the, the, the highest market share you can get in your local area, why go through necessarily the pain for the smaller MSPs here, so sub 50 seats? Why go necessarily through the pain of actually having another location, another uh, another culture? Who's going to be in your management team going to basically look after that location, and make, and try and make sure that location doesn't feel like it's the the poor cousin or the the redheaded uh, stepchild or whatnot? And you need to make sure that the the business values and ethics are and culture and value uh, are 
are ubiquitous in all of your offices, and that's really hard maintaining that into either branch or sub locations. I think that's really good advice. Um, I know that, you know, we talked about geography. I know another reason that I've seen MSBs, um, it, I mean, growth from a growth perspective, but they, just to buy a book of business, right? They see an MSP that's about ready to exit and they're like, look, I just, I don't want these customers to be fed to the wolves here. I, I trust you just buy my book of business here and take my customers and, and make them your, your own. Um, I love that advice about don't don't spread out geography too like too quickly, um, because it doesn't matter whether it's through M and A or you decide to open up an office in another location, um, unless you've got it equally balanced, there is always going to be an office. It's like, well, we don't get that because the headquarters gets it right, and it's that culture piece becomes really difficult to spread across a wide area. So that's oh, really yeah. really good. Yeah, that's great advice. That's a big issue. And I like yeah. that idea where you said there, and we did that a number of times, buying a, a small book of business. It's you, it's almost a numbers game nowadays as well. Back when we were doing it, it was quite, it, it probably was, but there was just not a, nowhere near as much of it happening in our market space. Um, but I think it was, if you look at what it costs to pick up a, win a new customer nowadays through marketing, through all the amount of touch points you need to do, it can be actually quite cost effective in buying some of these businesses. Now, it depends on what size you are, depending on what size the the actual demographic of client or your target customer profile is. So yes, you, you will inherit, I'll say it, and sorry for those listening, you will inherit a pile of shit as well. So you might you might pick up about 30 or 40% of the clients are really good and in your demographic of what you're trying to look for. And then there might be another 30% of the customer base that, yeah, okay, you can, if they take the journey with you and mature up and things like that, they'll be really good. And then there's probably the last 30 or 40% that are just not in your target. And there's a fine line. A lot of people will keep them as long as they're not causing pain, as long as they're paying on time or on direct debit or ACH or those types of things for, for you guys up there, then people just don't get rid of them. But the, it also takes effort. It takes account management, internal management to manage those in that, those environments. And now with cyber, I think it opens up a, a, a potential large risk to the business as well in that every one of those have generally 365 tenancies they need to be secured appropriately and if they're not what's the brand reputation on you as the msp for not protecting that client even even if you did suggest to them to go and put the licensing in to put caps in to to basically block down locations and all of those and two factor and if they don't want it and don't agree to it then they're still going to blame you when something goes wrong anyway so I think there's a maturity piece around the clientele that you have and the clientele of the any business you're looking at. I was just going to say, like the due diligence piece, that's where it's really, really critical that you're you're identifying those gotchas because very quickly those will start to snowball into a bigger disaster. I would say from 2018 through 2022, so those four or five years in that in that kind of mark, was almost what I what I call like M and A FOMO. Everyone was anyone and everyone was doing M and A because they had fear of missing out. Like it's like, oh, everyone else can do it, I can do it. It's like, yeah, you kind of could. And the the big PEs and VCs or ultra capitalists instead of venture capitalists, I like to call them, um, as those guys coming in. They were doing what I'd call pretty light due diligence, like the bigger deals over over $5 million and things like that, or $10 million in the US, they were getting appropriate levels of due diligence. But anything sub that, and they probably sub $3 million, $2 million in Australia, um, and probably sub 3 to $5 million in the US, they were just doing a light due diligence and just acquiring, and they'd clean up the mess, integrate it pretty hard, and just clean up the mess as they go, because the, the numbers made sense, and they still do it now, to be clear. But... Yeah, the numbers really made sense to just keep going on a, a very quick acquisition path and um, and that arbitraging between buying at a low rate and what the value of your business is uh, means that it's, it, it covers a lot of sins for them. They've got a lot of time in, uh, to clean up the mess and the integration of those businesses. So I think, I think that's what's changed now in that there's still deals happening. There's no, I don't, I think it's slowed a little bit from the last two years, but not hugely. It might be 20 or 30% reduction. But I think people are now looking more serious about does the, an acquisition target or a strategic merge, which most are acquisitions, you just you just say they're mergers to, to keep for, for the egos and whatnot, which we did as well. 
Um, but I think most acquisitions you've got to seriously consider now is that does it actually give you that that amount of target customers you're looking for, or does it give you a skill set, or does it give you the revenue growth you want, and, and those types of pieces? I think they're that's critical, and I think that's what's really changed, I'd say, in the last twelve to eighteen months. That's great. Really appreciate that insight there. Um, so you went through. I, so I, I mentioned there. There's probably a lot of MSPs that have gone through some M&A, but there's probably not a lot of MSPs that have gone through as much M&A as you have, and obviously helped with recently. Are there any stories, or can you talk about any of the more recent um, M&A activities that you've been part of, um, especially from like a, a transition perspective? I mean, what's that like um, if, if I'm a buyer or I'm a seller? Like, what does that feel like? Yeah, look, I think, um, and now I can talk because I did, after uh, 24 years, we uh, we sold our MSP and I did a, a one-year uh, period with them. So on the 25th birthday, correct, I actually exited. And that was at the start of uh, last year, so at the start of 2022. Um, so I can talk about the sell side now. But from a lot of people I've spoken to, and I would say when you are preparing for sale, it's not just preparing the business. You've got to prepare yourself as well. You've got to have hobbies outside of your business. Most small business uh, owners, that their, their company or their business is another child. They spend more time with that than probably their family at home. And then if they sell the business and are no longer there, they have a, a very big, a pretty, a pretty big shock to the system for the change of their life. They used to have somewhere to go, they had a purpose or whatnot, and then they don't. Um, so there's two parts to that. One is if you're doing an acquisition and the owner's staying on, generally about the six month mark is the lowest point for them. Uh, they've lost, they've lost control. They love, they love that they don't have to deal with the financials. They don't have to deal with whatever the bits of the business they didn't like having to deal with anymore. So they really love that bit, but they also then don't, they realize pretty quickly that they don't have the decision-making power that they used to have. And a lot of times it's that about that six month mark. And I talk about it with with every person that we bought along the way, I would say these are the these are the highs and lows, these are the pitfalls and and whatnot. And it was described to me from a lot of people that we'd acquired along the way. Um, I hadn't felt it firsthand at that point in time, but I said always at about that six month mark is your lowest point. And if you can get through that six month mark, then you'll start coming back out out the other side, and it'll actually be good. But you've got to get through that point. And I used to have uh, owners talk to other owners that we'd, we'd work with and were still in the business and the original founder of Correct Wayne would actually have them talk to him about his how he felt about it on the way through and that helped them. Where now um, where I'm specifically doing what I'm prepping, a, uh, helping a company prepare for sale, I actually asked them, I said, as much as you want to double down and put a lot of effort in and clean up and do everything that I'm suggesting to you to increase the value of your business, I'm also kind of kicking you in the ass or... Uh, and getting you to go and actually find a hobby and do the things that you did when you were younger or find something new. So the when, the, and it's also, it's counterproductive because I'm forcing you to do it now when you want to double down on prepping, prepping your business for sale. But it actually helps because post the transaction, you have another love, you have a new hobby, you have something interesting that you want to do and that you can spend time on. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest thing nowadays that, to, that helps those people in that transition is going through it i went through it during the sale and, and whatnot it's like again yes you don't necessarily agree with certain things it's, it is that six months part you you wonder did you make the right decision and all of those so i went through that as well hilariously i've been telling people about it i had to remind myself and tell myself that yep this is what it's like um but i also had other things that i was doing in life and 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 time with the family and whatnot i sold the business at a time that both my girls were still in primary school and I got to take them to school every day. It was one of the things I chose to do. Was, uh, I got to take them to school every day when I was when I was here, and it was great. Uh, but I still do now. And that's something that I changed. But I knew that while I was running a mid-sized MSP with we 59 people, that I was putting too, too much time and effort into the business because that's what I thought what I, what I should be doing um, at a detriment, ultimately, of, of spending time with my girls. And whereas now I spend a lot of time with them, but I also now have a, a better work-life balance. I still work quite hard. I, as those that know me uh, know that I generally fit 48 hours into every 24, and that's what I've done for years, and uh, I've known to be quite intense like that, but I also now get to spend, uh, spend more time with the family. I've uh, also been part of a, <clears throat> a large M&A deal. Um, 
the same thing. It was a, I think we called it a, a merger, but it was really an acquisition and new boss, new, new, uh, shirts. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it was, it was really interesting to be part of, um, the, the sort of management team, the exec, the, the senior leadership team of the, the company, the MSP that was bought. Um, and I still stay, I've stayed in touch with, with them for a long, long time. Um, but just like you said, I mean, that, that owner of that original MSP that I was part of, you know, you could start to see, you know, he'd stayed on actually for, for two years instead of the normal one, um, because he really had faith. He wanted his, you know, services side of the business to continue to grow and to co to continue to invest in. But after a period of time, I mean, he had a real opportunity to go and, and, and do his love, which is what you're doing, which is consulting, right? And and sharing all that experience you've got with with tons and tons of different business owners and MSPs. So that's great. Um, that's a great great sort of insight into that. What it feels like when you're um, the buyer as well as the seller. And uh, and so speaking of one of the companies you bought was 360 Consulting back in 2018, right? And it was part of one of your acquisitions. So. Um, why'd you keep the name? I mean, that's you today, right? That's your business, your consulting business. What was what's the story behind that? I love the name. Let's be honest about it. Three sixty consulting could be used for absolutely anything. Um, look, it's not the only name I've got. Let's let's be honest about it. Every single business we bought along the way, we didn't necessarily take the underlying company. We we took the business name, and we would register a business of every everything we did. So, not not all of them. I'd say there's probably the last three or four that we did. So, I still have the the, the business names of multiple IT companies that I could relaunch at any point in time. Not that I'm looking at doing that uh, anytime soon. Uh, but yes, no, it's, uh, look, I love the 360 name and we actually took the underlying company. Um, so 360 Consulting now has been going around, has been in business since 2002. So we're, I'd say we're nearly 21 years. I need to look at the date. I don't remember it as well as the correct solutions one, but yeah, it's, it was August, September, I think it was, uh, or Septemberish, I think from memory. Um, so yeah, we're about to be a 21 year old consulting company. Now I'll openly talk that the first 15 of those years was as an MSP. So we had, had the experience in the industry as well, let alone what we did with correct solutions. And then we pivoted the business to being in a, an industry consultant. So yeah, for me, it was just the, the perfect name. It could be used for anything, not just what I do now. I was like, no, this name's too good. I'm not letting it go. And uh, even during the, the sale of correct solutions, it was like, no, we kept uh, all of these names and all these IP because it had nothing to do with what correct was. So I'd already kind of mentally planned for using it again in the future. That's great. Um, yeah, I love the name too. Um, and, and it's, you got a cool, cool brand and logo and everything like that. So great job <laughs> with that. So, uh, yep. you, yep. you're, you personally pivoted, right? Like you were, um, IT business yep. owner, everything like that. And so, as part of this, um, you taking over, you know, you you getting bought out and taking over um, 360 Consulting. What was the pivot like to consulting, and what were like the pros and cons of you going the consulting set? Yeah, it's, uh, look, let's be honest. A good MSP can't forget to consult, and the good a great MSP will always make sure they're consulting the clients, solving business pain points working out where, what they can supply to a client and let's be honest, get, get a, be, a greater share of the client's wallet or the client's spend. So that was across, we started in managed services or started in break fix, product procurement, software, VPOS, then to 365. We then did telephony, we did then did uh, uh, data links and all of those types of things, our own private cloud, public cloud. It was more just to try and take as many, uh, as much spend as you could out of a client. So you didn't need to have as many clients to have a good turnover. So the consulting piece, and that's what I think a lot of, even a lot of MSPs still forget that nowadays, is that consulting piece to the clients. They they grow too busy and we're guilty of that, but we also brought in our, our own kind of fractional CIO and IT managers service products that, that helped differentiate us a little bit and spent more time with the clients. But I think that transition into 360 from Correct was, yeah, it was... It was a little bit bumpy, I'd say. It's uh, and look, it looks from the outside, it looked pretty good, uh, but from the inside, it was like, okay, well, uh, just who who actually would want to engage me? And it's like everyone you talk to, it's like, no, go and do this. Everyone will do it, and it's like, and it's like you, you have a bit of self doubt. And it's like, oh, hang on, what plans do I put out there? Because I, everything I do is pretty much around reoccurring revenue that 
the managed service providers are used to uh, billing in reoccurring revenue, a lot of what they buy is in reoccurring. So I actually built all of my uh, my plans and consulting around that same same model. Instead of just billing you by the day, it's by uh, by uh, a, an hour every week or it's, uh, for every month or it's a, a half day every week or it's a day every week or whatnot. And then they have an associated monthly figure associated a figure with it. So for me, it was just doing that transition and it was quite it was quite interesting actually. Um, my I finished in. Uh, so probably a little bit more backstory here. So I finished in the 14th of Feb 22. That was the 25th anniversary. So it's uh, Valentine's Day. You know, we joked the correct was a Valentine's business. Um, but yes, that was the last day. And I was actually going to launch um, the 360 Consulting the next morning. So I was going to, I did a sign off on LinkedIn and Facebook and thank you for everything for all the clients and staff and everyone we've dealt with over the last 25 years. And I was going to take a break. And I had in my head, that I was actually going to, and I wanted to actually write up, uh, that I was going to basically at eight o'clock the next morning saying, I've had enough of a holiday now and I'm going to launch 360. Um, unfortunately, my father passed away three days before I finished. So instead of writing a uh, the, the next piece about 360, I was writing a eulogy instead, uh, which I could easily talk about. But it's, yeah, it was quite interesting. So I actually had a, a little, did a little bit of consulting, had to clean up his, uh, his estate. My uncle passed away. Uh, about six weeks later, so I had both of those that I was looking after, uh, their estates, etc. Uh, but yes, ended up doing a, a five and a half week or five week trip uh, to Europe, or basically Ireland, uh, with my father's from England, Scotland, and Wales. Took my whole family up there. We actually took half of, uh, half my father's ashes up there to bury on a on some family land up there. But yeah, when I came back, it was like okay, so that was mid August. I started actually really launching. I'd spoken to a few people. A few people called me while I was away, not knowing I was away and wanted to know what I was doing. I've had several offers. I've had offers to run uh, several larger 200-seat, uh, 300-seat MSPs. I'll take senior roles in those types of uh, environments, which I haven't. Um, but yes, it was it was quite funny. After coming back, it was like, okay, time to do something now. Um, and finally, uh, my, uh, this is another anecdote, I wanted to work 24-7. I heard this in the U.S., quite some time ago. I want to work 24-7. And everyone's going to be scratching their heads as I say that and as they listen to it. But it was 24 hours a week, seven months of the year. So ergo, I basically wanted to work about three days a week. Um, so within 14 weeks of coming back, so came back mid-August, so call it by the end of October last year, I was already at five days a week. Um, I'm sitting at about five and a half days. Uh, I'm waiting for a few deals to finalize and then I'm going to take a, a little, not a step back, but I'm going to reduce a little bit. So uh, I didn't, uh, a lot of people are joking uh, around me saying I work more now than when I actually owned the MSP. So it's quite funny. But I know I need to take a relax a little bit or not really relax, but slow down a little bit. Um, it's just hard when you're used to pushing the accelerator as hard as you were from, uh, as hard as you do from a young age. Uh, old habits die hard. <laughs> they can't. I can't use, I'm not used to the idea of not going really fast and, and doing things. So yeah, wow. so it's that, it's an interesting transition. What a roller coaster, you know, you sell your MSP, you, uh, you leave, you you, you have this whole plan of attack and then family, family, that's, that had to be, um, really, really difficult, but wow, to be able to be away for a couple of, uh, weeks or whatever, and then, you know, have everybody coming after you and you you knew what the plan was you knew what the future was um and it, and and even then you weren't sure if that was going to pan out and it, it certainly has fuzzy so i'm i'm really really happy for you there so that's no, great thank you it was good i enjoy doing a bunch of public speaking at industry events and uh and whatnot and that's probably how this podcast came about was doing some presentations and uh, and and openly talking about things i i and that's the thing i i don't see why so many people are necessarily cagey about or trying to hold back on what they do it's like for years even when we even after the first m eight, we would basically openly share about 80 percent of what we did on stage or anyone that asked and anyone that we knew we'd probably share 98 99 percent of it because even if i gave you our playbook uh, and chris if i gave you that your personality is different and you would do it differently so you'd want to change the steps to suit you so even if i gave you everything you'd do it differently regardless so that's why I've never, never felt or never felt the need to hold, hold information back or call it IP or any of those things. It's all about helping people and help. And kind of what drives me now is to help in, increase the maturity or increase the, 
and benefit the industry um, in Australia and New Zealand and and ultimately globally. But yeah, let's. It's a it's a great industry to be in. It's served me well. It's, it's it looks after a lot of people. We're we're critical in so many businesses that people don't realise what we actually do and how important it is. So yeah, it's it's you can see I'm a little bit passionate about trying to to help people, but also trying to improve the industry we're in. Well, speaking of speaking of your public speaking, you built quite a personal brand. You know, you 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 speak at industry events, like you said. You're doing podcasts. People keep saying this to me, Chris. Yeah. It's quite funny. I, I, I think it's a, I think it's funny and hilarious and a joke, but you're right. How, how intentional is that, Fuzzy? And why is that important? Uh, look, I, I would actually, I'd say it's probably quite accidental. I've actually got my first influencer contract, and it's like, what, the, what the hell? <laughs> I don't know if I feel it need to be clear, but it's just. It's just really strange. It's like, yeah, I'm uh, doing podcasts and webinars with people. And, and the funny part about it, none of it's on my own brand. Like none of it, I, 360 doesn't have a YouTube channel. I don't have a YouTube channel. I don't, don't have, I don't do um, uh, Twitter. I don't do Instafan. I don't do any of those types of things. It's, uh, it's five minutes on Facebook at a personal level and it's a little bit on LinkedIn and that's about it. It's, uh, but you, you're not the only one that keeps telling me I've got this sexy personal brand. And at some point, I probably should do something with it. Anyway, so what's the future? What's the future look like for the Australia New Zealand market? Obviously, that's your, you know, your 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 home is in Australia. You know, what are you keeping your eye on? What, what's what's the future look? Look, it's it, it depends on the size of the segment, um, of like of, of MSPs. To be honest, I'd say the smallest sub twenty seat MSPs. Um, I've said for a while, like security, still it's the paramount. Everyone needs to do it. They should have been doing it for a while, but they're probably playing catch up in that area. Um, in the 25 to 75 or sub 100 MSPs, um, security is a given. ISO 27001 um, in that 100 to 250 seat MSPs, ISO requirements are, are now a given. If you don't have your ISO requirements or ISO tick off, then you're probably not getting some of the bigger deals. You can't get any government work. You can't get any large enterprise work or any customer that then works with a government department requires you to be ISO certified. So that's happening. Um, I think the, uh, obviously there's a bit in, in generative AI and I, uh, we won't go too much onto that because I'm, uh, I think most of what we deal with nowadays is actually machine learning. And everyone just calls it AI because it's a nicer name where in reality 98% is probably machine learning and there's probably a little bit of AI in there. Um, so I won't get on that one. Um, I think that's where can you add value? Where, where's the consulting piece? I, I, it's interesting. I had someone on a panel uh, probably three or four weeks ago and they have now probably 600 clients and they've, look, they've got probably 140, 150 staff. They're, they're focused on the, the, the SMB segments, but I would almost say that scares the crap out of me nowadays with the liability around, uh, around cyber. Um, if all of those clients aren't actually following your security uh, essentials or security requirements, which most of them probably aren't, then what's the reputational liability on on your MSP or on your business uh, when something goes wrong? It does, as, as we talked earlier on at the, at the start of the podcast, um, the customer's going to blame you regardless. They're never going to blame themselves. They're going to go and ta- go to another provider. The chances are, I'd say, seventy-five to eighty percent chance you're going to lose a customer that ever gets breached because they go go elsewhere and blame you for not doing it and then follow the next provider's advice. It happens. It's just what what, what happens. Um, so I, I actually wonder whether, um, and if I ever did it again, and not that I look I'm young enough to, to go and do this again and multiple times, but if I ever did it again, I'd actually want less customers, but are probably a little bit bigger where you can go deeper with them, where you can spend more time consulting, where you can go in and start looking at that and building the intellectual property around some middleware between two of their apps. So how do you take something out of a legacy app and put it into a cloud, like integrate it with a cloud CRM or a cloud system where you need to have data in both, but how do you actually have that data uh, interface where it's not just one way through CSVs? How can it be dynamically updating both directions? All of those things. I think that's where, I think that's the next, or not really the next thing. I think that's where the value has always been and where the higher margin for providers would be is in that consultative piece and it's hard when most people have or most MSPs have more clients than what they what they really need or should have 
and it's all to do with they want a certain amount of revenue and think that that's that's the best way of getting the revenue and the margin and really profitability is more important than that it is around uh, around revenue as I've said for years everyone knows that revenue is vanity and profit sanity except I just added an extra one to that and that's cash flow is king because really it's what's in your bank account that really matters and doing that higher level consulting work even if it's only a couple of people within your business the amount of projects that that can lead lead uh, into your clients that you, a lot of times I've seen MSPs at 45 50 staff and they can't have any more than about 25 to 30 clients because of how deep their relationships and how much they're helping those clients in in not just the IT system, but how to get the most out of a CRM, how to get the most out of, uh, of their management systems, all of those things. Uh, Power Apps, Power BI, all of those things, no code, low code. Like, how can you build something that works for someone um, that can be used and, and build a bit of intellectual property for yourself? Because that actually increases the valuation of your business as well. Now, the only, th- the only thing I would say to that, though, is any time you build these things, build a hell of a lot of internal documentation around it. What assumptions you made, why you did something. It's a bit like commenting on code. Make sure you comment on stuff so then when you come back to it a year later or two years later or if the person that develops it's no longer there, you've got half a chance to actually uh, fix something or, or uh, take it better or improve it um, and keep developing it. Than when you uh, when you come back and look at something you did two years ago and you've got no idea why you made that, it's no different. I've got perfect examples where as we as we used to price product out in the MSP, the first products we priced out probably eight ten years ago was just a spreadsheet with a bunch of formulas and this that and the other. And you look you open them two three five ten years later, it's like, what the hell was I thinking here? What does this do? And you're just chasing around formulas trying to figure out what you did. So then we actually did this uh, uh, probably eight, nine years ago, we started uh, an old pricing spreadsheet to be built and I, I did this for myself. I actually put an extra tab down the bottom that was all the assumptions and all of the comments and the reasons why we did it. Then we used to put comments into certain cells about why you were doing certain things. And it was funny, at the time you're wondering why you do it and it's like, then you realize and then you come back to something like that two years later and it's like, oh, this is one of these ones, okay. That assumption was no longer right, but at least I documented why I did it. Or, no, these three items are valid, but let me tweak those now and let me adjust the formula or adjust the margin percentage or the amount of effort going into something. And it's so much quicker to to reprice a product or copy that and price something else. So, sorry, a bit of a segue there, but yeah. That's great. So what uh, what's the future hold for you, Fuzzy? What 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 are you up to? Um, look, I... Um, look, <laughs> <laughs> three, it was funny just thinking back now when you asked that. Part of 360 was to, uh, to basically do enough consulting to to pay me to go and do to go to some of the industry uh, events again and pay for the flights and accommodation and, the, and access and things like that and, and have a bit of play money. So that's kind of ultimately where 360 was going and what, what it was for. And I've well surpassed that. And But yeah, look, there's there's plenty of other industry events I'd love to still go to. Um, it's interesting. I'm going to a lot of like... Uh, certain vendors and whatnot i get called in to speak and uh, etc that happens but there's other other things i'd love to do is the um uh, the where a vendor takes a bunch of partners away and this is a, i've not done one yet i had i did have two invites a couple of months ago but just the timing didn't work but going on some of the the vendor and partner um events the not events sorry getaways or whatnot where you can just talk with people around a dinner table or whatnot and they can learn a lot from the experience you've got so I'd love to do some of those types of things where it may be a, a short 30-minute or a one-hour presentation of Q&A, but then it's just plenty of time just uh, going through experiences or, or whatnot and, and talking to people about your experiences with the IT in the industry and the M&A and whatnot. So I'd like to probably do a bit of that. Um, I'd love to jump on a few not-for-profit boards. I, I sat on a not-for-profit board for quite some time, for five or six years ago. That was about 10 years ago. I'd love to get back and pro- probably give back a little bit in those areas. But as I said, even at, uh, uh, probably halfway through the pod, it was, yeah, I want to I want to try and better the industry. I want to help people that are either not going as well and and help them turn around. I want to help the the bigger guys be more efficient. And uh, again, as something we used to sell in our in our MSP, uh, we want to help the small guys take it up against the big guys. And that's no different than what I'm doing again now at 360. In that, yeah, you can get plenty of M and A advice from the the top tier accounting firms and the the top big firms in the US that. But they're going to charge you half a million dollars to to pay to play. Where 
I, I charge bugger all in the scheme of things because I'm doing it a lot for passion. Um, I do a very professional, t- just to be clear on that, in, in case anyone wonders. But yes, I'm not. It's, I'm not doing it for the way I'm doing it because I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I get paid well as well, to be clear. But I just want to. I, I want to help the small guys that don't have the experience. How to? How can they ma- have their first acquisition be a success, rather than most people learn badly from their first one about how not to do things. And often acquisitions two and three, you learn. Okay, you you learn which mistakes. You don't make those mistakes, but you make other mistakes. And even after 10 for ourselves and 30 plus uh, for others in, in the correct days, and now probably another, probably 10 or 12 already in 360, every single time you learn something new. And I've got massive lists of things to look for and red flags and things to look for in due diligence or little quirks that people say or little random comments someone says. It's like, hang on, we need to del- dig into that or delve into that because that could be a problem in the future. Um, so I just want to be able to help, help people have make make whatever they're doing successful. That's great. I also wrote down, grow into top social media influencers. So don't forget about that one. <laughs> All right. So we'll be, che- we'll be cheering for you for sure. I, I, I just got to fit that into the 48 hours. Um, <laughs> it kind of doesn't, uh, doesn't work when you try to slow down, but, uh, but at the same token, you're right. Yes. Look, I love throwing some good content out there. I love throwing some, uh, some interesting questions on my LinkedIn that make people, uh, uh, post some ideas and uh, make them think outside of the box. It's yeah, what I like, what I enjoy doing. All right, so here's the million dollar question: When did you know? Now that's it. When that I'm the I'm the M and A guy. Well, that's it. I made it. I don't know if I have. Um, it's when a lot of people just come to you. When everyone, when I've got vendors, partners, uh, other IT companies. Um, introducing me to people saying, oh, you need to speak to Farzah, you need to speak to Ryan about uh, about prepping your business sale or you're looking to buy someone or something like that. It's, yeah, it's I, I it's funny. My website looks like rubbish. It's a, well, sorry, it's a postcard website that uh, lists a couple of things of what I do. Uh, I've had, a, had it on my list to actually build it out. I got most of the way there, but a, a developer disappeared on me. But um, in hindsight, it's probably good. Um, I don't, it's, it's interesting. I don't have a lot of time in that, uh, I spend all my time helping people and, uh, yeah. at the same token, I get multiple referrals every week. And sometimes people take six or 12 months before they're ready. Yeah. I give everyone an hour for free. It's what I do, uh, regardless. Yeah. And some people just get enough information out of that hour that they come back a couple of years later or they don't need me or whatnot. And that's fine. Uh, as I said, as if it's helping other people and helping, you know, helping improve the maturity of the industry, then I'm all for it. Fantastic. Buzzy, thank you so much for talking to us today. You were fantastic first guest from Down Under. So thanks for being here. And I wish you absolutely the best of luck. And uh, I hope you hit that social media plateau, that influencer plateau that you're striving for. Or that you're striving for before. Yeah. <laughs> the Beach Chris, and thank you for, thanks for having me. And it's been a, a great conversation. <laughs>